Uh, welcome, Eric, to Ahimsa Conversations. Um, I always start by asking everyone, what is their early, what is your earliest memory of uh, nonviolence, Ahimsa? So yeah, I was thinking about this, and and uh, I don't really have like a, a an early strong memory. Um, I'm from kind of a conservative part of the country here, and uh, didn't really grow up, you know, exposed to nonviolence or ahimsa in any kind of direct uh, way that I can really remember, apart from maybe just getting some basic values from my parents, you know, but they also were, were kind of unfamiliar with nonviolence and ahimsa. And uh, so I think in the U.S., you know, we're all exposed to Martin Luther King, right, uh, from a very early age. But even that isn't really um, through the lens of nonviolence. You know, we learn about him as someone who fought for civil rights and uh, against segregation, but we at least for me, I didn't come away uh, from learning about him when I was a child uh, with a strong sense of nonviolence being like uh, his animating force. Uh, and so uh, for me, I think I was really uh, first really exposed in a more direct way actually in college. So kind of much later uh, in, in life, I think, than a lot of, of people. Um, and I had, I remember having a class that touched on Gandhi and other nonviolent movements uh, at some point, and it didn't really strike me yet still at that point. Um, it took me some, it had to be repeated uh, a number of times before I think it hit me in a way where it really, uh, you know, completely kind of captured, you know, my, my imagination. And so Later in college, I had another class um, while I was uh, interning in Washington, D.C., and the class was called something like Solutions to Violence or Alternatives to Violence, and it was covering peacemakers and, and nonviolent movements and, and uh, from around the world and throughout history, and that was the first time that I was, I, I felt like really exposed to it in a very deep way and and it really challenged me and but also inspired me and it was kind of a real transformative moment in my life because even up until that point I still had pretty conservative politics actually and so um, it was kind of this real shock to my system when I started to really uh, pay attention and to think about nonviolence for the first time. And so, what yeah, year was this? this would have been 2001, so almost 20, 20 years ago. Yeah, it was the summer of 2001, right before the the attacks, the 9/11, you know, attacks here. And um, and yeah, I was actually, it's kind of a, a crazy story, but I was um, I was studying political science at the time in college, and and like I said, hadn't really been exposed to a more critical kind of way of looking at the world. And so I was actually working for, um, in, in the world of private intelligence. I was like helping to um, protect kind of like the most powerful corporations and people in the world and writing intelligence reports to kind of protect their interests. And so I was really on the other side of the, the political spectrum, you know, at that point. And so I feel like I've, I had to come a long way to get to nonviolence, um, but um, but yeah, it was really the result of this incredible teacher, you know, who kind of opened my eyes and, and challenged my thinking. So, um, and and who was that? His name is Coleman McCarthy. Um, maybe you've heard of him, but he uh, he still is teaching around the Washington D.C. area. You know, he's taught for decades now and is kind of. Uh, you know, somebody who really has been a big figure in the world of peace education and mm. promoting peace education, you know, and getting new programs started at high schools and colleges around the country. And, and he was for a long time a columnist at the Washington Post. Um, and so he has a journal, a background as a journalist, but he's just, he was an incredible teacher. And if there was anybody who was most directly responsible for me, 
kind of making this dramatic change in my life. It was really, uh, you know, getting to learn from him and, and, uh, yeah, I have a, a lot of, I feel like I owe a great debt to him, um, because he really, uh, was the one who kind of brought me to this, to this thing that has really become my life, you know? And I think I kind of, after that experience, I really wanted to try to, to do for others what he had done for me in terms of opening how he opened my eyes to this whole other way of, of looking at the world. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of how I then kind of modeled what I did after. Where where were you born? You said you were, uh, you grew up in a very conservative state. Could you tell me when and where you were born and uh, where you grew up? Yeah. So I'm originally from Peoria, Illinois, which is, um, two or three hours south of Chicago. It's uh, it's kind of in the rural, more farming kind of part of, of the state. And I mean, it is, Peoria is a city, but it's also, um, you know, surrounded by kind of farmland. And it's been known kind of historically in the U.S. as kind of a, a place that really represents, uh, you know, kind of middle America, you know, kind of really kind of what is the average kind of American think. Peoria is often referenced as this kind of like kind of weather vane for uh, kind of traditional America. I was, I'm, I was born in 1980, um, so 39 now. And uh, yeah, um, I grew up kind of in a, my family was uh, pretty religious. Um, so but in the Catholic tradition. And so I grew up going to church, you know, every Sunday. And it's a big, still a very big part of my parents and my family's life. And um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty conservative part of the country, generally. Um, and so, so yeah, that's kind of uh, my, my background. And, uh, and then after college, you were uh, in Afghanistan and Philippines as a reporter. Were you there covering the war in Afghanistan? I, I actually went on a trip with Kathy Kelly. For a long time, i kind of been an, uh, an admirer of, of voices for creative nonviolence and voices in the wilderness and Kathy and, and had gotten to befriend her over the years and always thought that I would have liked to, to join her on one of the trips that she was making. Um, and, you know, so, so finally after years of, of really knowing her, she invited me to, to join um, one of their delegations to Afghanistan um, back in, maybe it was 2010, if I remember right, 2009 or 10. And um, I also kind of before that, for years, I had my kind of interest in, in, my, in my own personal writing um, had been around, you know, war and militarism and U.S. foreign policy. And so I had written quite a bit at that point already for, on, on those kinds of topics, but I, you know, I had never been to an, a, a war zone and never kind of seen it with my own eyes. Or, and so I, I felt like when I was offered to, to join, you know, a trip there, I felt like it would be a really important experience, you know, to actually have yeah a, a personal experience with what war looks like and meeting people on the other end of you know US foreign policy and so yeah I joined it was one of her first trips actually to Afghanistan I think she had maybe been a couple times before so um, we were still trying to get the lay of the land when we were there and making lots of contacts and and setting up lots of meetings to to meet people kind of you know, government figures and people working in humanity, doing humanitarian work and non-governmental organizations. And um, so, yeah, we, we, we met a lot of interesting people and, and spent a couple of weeks with the um, Afghan peace volunteers who, you know, are just an incredibly inspiring group. Um, that was really a highlight of, that, of the trip for me. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it ended up being a really powerful experience, but um, you know, a very difficult experience too, because I had never, uh, you know, really seen it, like I said, with my own eyes. And it was, it's painful, you know, to, to see how, how difficult, you know, life is there and to know how responsible the U.S., you know, is in a lot of ways for the situation there. 
So Eric, was the trip to Afghanistan an important landmark in your journey towards uh, becoming a full-time non-violence uh, activist and, uh, uh, you know, a mission, um, a, an advocate of the cause of non-violence? It, it was a, an important moment in my life um, in terms of uh, really deepening my, you know, appreciation for, um, you know, like I said, it was my first time experiencing what war, having a small taste of what, what war really looks like and, and meeting people. So it was like a very impactful in that way. Um, and I felt like when I returned, you know, in my writing and my critique of, of, of war and militarism, you know, I could really speak more from the heart and more from personal experience than I could before, which I think I still had more of a historical, academic, kind of big picture, you know, kind of critique of, of, of war and violence, but it was kind of the first time that I, you know, I had, could speak from real personal experience in that way. But I had really, following my experience in college with that professor, I, I, I kind of committed myself more to nonviolence at that moment. So, um, you know, almost 10 years prior to, to going to Afghanistan. So it really became my life's kind of purpose at, at that point. And so I was already well into the journey at that point. Yeah. What is waging nonviolence and how did you come to start it? So Waging on Violence is a, an online publication that I started with a couple friends of mine who are journalists uh, about 11 years ago now. Um, and uh, the, the purpose uh, in starting it was, you know, the three of us had been kind of working journalists, freelance journalists, mainly prior to the, the website. And we all had our own kind of personal interests in nonviolence at that point. Um, and we felt that, you know, it was a topic that wasn't really getting the attention that it deserved in the wider media at that point, even in the more alternative or progressive media here in the U.S. And so we felt like it was a topic that deserved, you know, much more focused attention and that there were a lot of stories that could be told uh, that weren't being told at the time, uh, especially through a nonviolent lens, right? Where you really, it's kind of drawing on the history of nonviolence and, you know, the, the knowledge that we've built up about how nonviolence works. And um, that even when you see stories in bigger media about protests and social movements, uh, the journalists rarely have uh, any kind of deeper sense of uh, where that's coming from or, or kind of a, a real uh, appreciation for it. So we wanted to try to do that, but also um, we had kind of several purposes in starting the website. You know, one was to kind of also challenge the idea um, of, that I think a lot of people have about what nonviolence is or what protest looks like. And I think a lot of people just think of Gandhi and Martin Luther King, and maybe they just think about marches and people holding signs. Or, you know, their, 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 their uh, understanding of it is very narrow and kind of limited. And so we wanted to try to highlight, you know, all the ways that nonviolence can be expressed, right? And the idea that there are literally kind of limitless possibilities, right, with what uh, kinds of actions and tactics and things that people can do to try to create social change using nonviolence and kind of in particular to highlight um, the more kind of uh, the creativity that nonviolence can unleash. So the way that people can use music and you know, humor and the arts and dance and theater and, you know, just kind of all those interesting creative, you know, ways that nonviolence can, can express itself. And so we wanted to do that. And then also to, I think, highlight the, the success stories and the victories that are often kind of won along the way. And we realized, I think, from an early point that 
you know, activists and people that are engaged in movements often aren't very good at kind of claiming their victories, right? And acknowledging the, the progress that they've made um, because we often have this long-term vision of what the world can be and what it should be and, and we're not there. And so we don't want to stop and say we've, we've taken a step in the right direction. We, we still are always striving for something better. And that's, I think that's good. You know, we need to always work for that better world. But I think it's also important to like acknowledge that we're making, we're taking steps in the right direction all the time. And, and you, I think it's, it's helpful in terms of keeping people motivated, right? About like wanting to stay involved in the struggle for justice and peace. But um, yeah, it's also like just a strategic, uh, I think good, good practice, right? Because, you know, people also want to think that if they're gonna put their time and money and put their bodies on the line, uh, that, that there might be a chance that, you know, they might actually win, you know, that they might actually be able to like realize their, their vision and their dreams. And so, you know, to, to kind of acknowledge that you've made some progress along the way, it then I think often motivates more people to want to get involved. And so we wanted to try to do that. And whenever we saw stories of even partial victories, we would try to highlight those stories to kind of hopefully inspire more people to get involved in nonviolence. And then, you know, we also were kind of, I had studied nonviolence in more of an academic way prior and uh, wrote my, my, my dissertation or my thesis on um, different approaches to nonviolence. And so I was also very into that um, distinction between kind of the more um, pragmatic, you know, strategic approach to nonviolence versus the ethical, moral, religious approach. And, um, and so, but I, I really appreciated, you know, both approaches to nonviolence. And I felt like we, we wanted to try to bring those different worlds together because I realized that folks that were in these different camps often weren't really in conversation with each other and didn't really appreciate the, the strengths and the insights from uh, the different approaches to nonviolence. And I felt like I personally got a lot from looking at both of those histories and those understandings of nonviolence. And so we created the site in a way where we wanted to invite people with different approaches to nonviolence to kind of contribute to this one publication so that we could hopefully learn from each other and kind of work together more closely to, you know, to kind of hopefully present uh, a more united kind of front, you know, around nonviolence and also be more effective because we could work together and have a, have a bigger kind of coalition. So that was, those were some of the purposes, you know, with starting the site. Um, in addition to, again, like kind of really challenging the way that I think the mainstream media and, you know, I think, um, you know, either ignores nonviolence or misinterprets what nonviolence means. And so we wanted to kind of foster a more sophisticated conversation about nonviolence in the wider media for people. So. Yeah. How do you keep it going? Because I know how difficult it is to get funding for such creative endeavors, uh, which don't really fit into any neat box. Yeah. So how do you manage that? Yeah, it, it's, it's still in many ways a labor of love. Um, you know, for the first couple years, we had absolutely no funding. We didn't even have any donations or anything. It was just something that we wanted to do uh, the three of us, and we um, were we were writing, you know, most of the content ourselves for the first couple of years. Who and are the other two people, Eric? Can you just mention their names? Brian Farrell, who I still work on the site with, who's the other co-editor, um, and another person named Nathan Schneider, who um, was with the site for many years and has since uh, moved on. Um, and so it was the three of us, and... Um, and I think it was a way initially just to keep, to, to create some accountability for, for us in terms of our own writing. And cause you know, being a freelance journalist is, is 
there's a lot of challenges with uh, with that. And one is not having, you know, um, kind of any regular, you know, someone who's keeping an eye on you or checking on you. And we felt like by committing to each other to, to work on this publication, we could kind of, uh, you know, uh, we could all be hopefully more productive in our, in our writing and, and try to explore this thing that we were passionate about. And, and so initially it was just this uh, truly a labor of love. There wasn't, you know, there wasn't any kind of support behind it. And then a couple of years in, we received our first kind of grant um, that uh, allowed us to start, we actually started to pay um, writers to, to write for the website. And, and I think we paid ourselves a small amount to kind of edit it, like a little stipend, but not enough really to, not like, a, not a living wage for New York City. Um, and we're still not really, even after all these years, um, we're still not really paying ourselves in a way that looks comparable to what, you know, editors or, or writers would make for other, you know, bigger publications. But um, we basically have survived these years uh, with a combination of, of grants. Right now, we don't have, um, we're, we don't really have any large grants right at the moment. And so we're running really primarily on reader donations and people that are uh, members, you know, people who are donating on kind of a monthly basis to the website. And, and there are a few hundred people that do kind of, that are sustaining members. And that provides the bulk of our budget right now, um, which is still uh, very, very small um, by comparison to any other media. But we've managed to make it work over all these years. And um, we're always trying to figure out how to make it more sustainable, but uh, it, it is really a challenge. Um, we also, we launched, we relaunched the website last year with kind of a new model where we have a community section for the website. And that is um, where we have kind of organizational partners, um, a combination of more grassroots, um, grassroots organizations like mm -hmm. Campaign Nonviolence, um, or the Meta Center for Nonviolence uh, and uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation. But then we also have several university uh, partners. So we have the Resistance Studies Initiative, which is in part out of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And um, we had um, a program at Rutgers University who was a member and uh, others. So we have a combination of universities and organizations that are now part of the website and that has also kind of helped to um, give us some financial uh, a little bit more financial stability um, but we're still operating on kind of a shoestring shoestring budget eric i know you've been part of a book called beautiful trouble a toolbox for revolution mm -hmm. was is that book I, I believe you have a contribution to that book is that also about nonviolence? Yeah, it is. It's a it's a really great uh, resource if you haven't seen it. Um, uh, it it uh, it's a book that really breaks down kind of um, the different. It really focuses more on the cre creative activism, and so um, they have different sections where they look at uh, specifically different tactics, different kind of principles of of activism and nonviolence. And then kind of case studies of different groups and, and movements. And, um, and what's nice about it is that each chapter is only a couple pages long. And so you can get kind of a, a, a nice tight snapshot of different ideas for creative action and different principles behind them and how they kind of interlink. And there have been a group of, of, uh, of, trainers and the writers behind the book have kind of actually created a whole training program around the book and their materials and they do trainings around the united states and around the world um, with uh, groups to try to help them think through creative actions and to be um, to get their kind of creative juices going for um, their own movements and so um, the, the, the the international there's an international component of it, which I think they call Beautiful Rising. And that's the group that has done trainings around Africa and Asia and Latin America, and I think focused more on the global south. And, um, and, but yeah, it's a really, 
great resource for for people that are wanting to try to like have a, a good grounding in the basics i think yeah i think it up um eric in the 11 years that waging nonviolence has been working and uh, do you feel that the problem of violence in the world at large has gotten worse whether it is uh, random school shootings in the us or the continuing escalation of militarization uh, do you feel things are getting worse i i actually don't um i think the the common perception you know among a lot of folks is that it's getting worse um i think in part that's because of our media and the fact that we have this 24-hour media that is uh focused you know more so on um highlighting what's going wrong you know and the problems in the world and so you see every instance of of violence you know and and when you just are hit with that over and over and over again you you come away with this perception that things are always getting worse i think um but at least when you i think step back and try to put put it in more historical kind of context and um look at different different forms of violence um and how they've evolved over the decades and over the centuries i think in in a lot of ways um and by a lot of measures i think violence actually is declining um and that's not to say that we don't have a lot of work to do um and that um we don't still live in a very violent world in a very militarized world but i actually think that um also in terms of just kind of methods of struggle i think um you know nonviolence i think has become over time more and more of a dominant way that that people struggle for peace and justice and and violent um violent struggles and movements are are on the decline and have been for for decades i believe and when you look at like the work of erica chenoweth you know who's really studied this um you know she's really documented that very clearly and um and then thinking also of like steven pinker's book um you know the better angels of our nature where he looks at the history of violence and and kind of the different trends on on all different on many different forms of violence he shows how things have actually i think improved but um but i don't think that we like i said we still have a long ways to go and a lot of work to do to to move the world forward um but yeah i'm 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 maybe oddly hopeful um about the trajectory that that we are on do you feel this way despite the difficulty in uh, you know getting gun control laws uh, in the us because i know that in the obama administration there was an attempt to uh, have tighter controls on at least small arms and I, I, and as far as i know that didn't succeed so how how do you feel about that yeah that's definitely a major problem in the us and and something where there hasn't been really forward movement you know and and uh it's i think we have a lot of work to do here in the us with especially on on the issue of gun control right that we have a a country that is has this strange obsession you know with with arms and and uh you know we're more heavily armed i think than any other country in the world in that way i mean in some ways it parallels the fact that we have by far the largest military right in in the world and we put more resources our government puts more resources into weapons and war than anywhere else and then our people are more armed than anyone else and so i mean i you know uh we have yeah we have a lot of work to do and and um at the same time i think um you know when you see polling on on gun reform in the us um it's not as 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 bad as you might imagine you know that i think there are a lot of basic reforms that have majority support and and, and sometimes like a shockingly high like for some of the the lowest bars with gun uh gun reform like universal background check or something you know you you know you find sometimes that 
80 or 90 percent of Americans support that. And it's just such a very obvious kind of basic thing that we should be um, doing, but that continues to be blocked more by special interests, right, by the National Rifle Association. And, um, and so for me, when I see the fact that we haven't made progress, it's more, it's not as much a sign of uh, the, you know, public opinion or, or where ordinary people are at here, but of how kind of undemocratic our system is. And the fact that like, you have something that 80 or 90 percent of people want that cannot get past you know shows a real fundamental kind of breakdown in our in our democratic system and so i think we we have a lot of work to do to kind of break through that um and i think you know the the students from parkland you know who organized after the school shooting there i think have done a lot of incredible work to move um, move the country on that topic and to try to build some momentum to change um, some of those policies. And, and a lot of those kids are now of voting age and they've really mobilized around a voting out, you know, some of the politicians that have blocked those basic reforms over the years. And so I am hopeful, you know, that especially the, the younger generations that are coming up are, are very focused on this, especially because of the school shootings, um, that, they're, that they're not gonna stop until we do see some real change. I think, I think it is coming, but it's, it's definitely something that we have to still do a lot of work on, yeah. Eric, before we close uh, the big one, uh, which is the presence of a nonviolence atmosphere and also a nonviolent ethos, in the recent anti-racism protests mm -hmm. uh, because it was uh, the the original problem the problem itself is fundamentally that of structural violence and yet am i correct in reading the situation that uh, the response to that injustice has been overwhelmingly non-violent am i right Yes, that's correct. So what, what can, and, and since we know that structural injustice is a reality across the world, what are some of the key learnings from the recent anti-racist protests, which have remained nonviolent in the US? What would you say are the key learnings from that for people elsewhere in the world and in the US? Yeah, I think we have a lot to learn from the the movement for black lives here. And, you know, I think it's been fascinating how much, uh, how, how much it has transformed the conversation, you know, in the US in just such a short amount of time, you know, in the last month or two, this has become the dominant uh, topic, you know, in the country. And um, I think that has happened because the, the protests have been so predominantly nonviolent, you know, I think in the early, earlier stages where there was more property destruction and signs that things were potentially, you know, that there were some small acts of violence, um, you know, it was diverting the conversation and it was becoming a real dominant topic, you know, in the media here. And, um, and I felt like it was distracting from you know, the message of the movement and what their demands um, were for justice. And so, um, but there was a point after a couple of weeks where it really kind of uh, the nonviolent character of the movement really became dominant and, and it moved, the conversation then kind of moved back towards um, the issue of police violence and brutality and what the alternatives can, can look like. And I think for me, it really showed the importance of trying as as for as hard as possible to uh, to to stick with nonviolence, right? That that is the way that you're going to keep the message on point and focused on the the real injustices and and what you know how we want to change uh, the world. So that was that's been a big kind of takeaway and. You see already, you know, I think some really promising signs of change, right, in the U.S. on 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 these issues where cities are really talking about and making commitments to 
you know, redirect resources, you know, away from police departments and putting them back into communities and, and even, you know, in Minneapolis, dismantling the police department, right, and, and starting over and thinking about a different way of thinking about what does community safety look like and, and um, you know, I, I think ultimately we're going to need to even move towards disarming police, you know, or, or a lot of police that, um, you know, there are places where, uh, you know, there are a lot of other developed countries where the average police officer on the street isn't carrying a gun, right? And, um, and that way it can't escalate so quickly to deadly violence. Um, and, and so I think we need to also uh, have that conversation here and I've seen hints of that. So I, I've been inspired by that. But then also I think the, one of the lessons from these movements, right, is the importance of persistence, right, and, and, you know, the fact that these protests have continued, you know, really every day for the last um, couple months, I think has not let the, the, the conversation move on, right, it's forced people to really, to really sit with this uh, issue, and to really think about it, and it's kind of forced, to, it's forced the, the conversation and, um, but even stepping back further to see that, you know, this is, this movement didn't come from nowhere, right? That it, it had actually started back in, you know, 2013, or at least the most recent iteration of it, you know? And, and so this has been developing for seven years now. And I think, um, you know, you actually see when you look at also polling that the people's opinions about um, race and um, the problems of policing have been moving in the direction of the movement for all of those years. And so I think we finally hit this kind of tipping point recently. So it shows you that sometimes it takes many years, right, of organizing and mobilizing to try to like move uh, a country, especially on such a, a, a difficult issue, you know, as, as, as policing and something that, you know, uh, we were, I think, very, we have a very conservative kind of uh, outlook on in general in this country. And so, you know, it takes a lot of work and a lot of commitment and dedication. So I think that's something that you, you need to, people need to kind of take away from what does it take to really affect change, you know, and it's not something that happens with, you know, one rally or one protest, but it often requires years of, of kind of commitment. And um, they've shown the, the power of, of, of that, you know, through their, through their, their commitment to the work. So, um. And, and, and I'm, what I'm hearing implicit in what you're saying is that nonviolence as a method and as an approach uh, is, makes it possible to stay the course in this long term and, and see the change happen over a period of time. Is that, am I right in hearing you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think, yeah, you, you, you need to be committed for the, the long haul, you know. I mean, I think that, that violence, uh, people often have this, uh, this false idea that violence is a, quick, is a quick solution to things, that it works more quickly than nonviolence. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's actually not, you know, that's not the case. Even when you step back and look at it, even from like an academic sense, like I was saying, the this Erica Chenoweth study of nonviolent versus violent movements, you know, found that that nonviolent movements reach their goal, you know, twice as 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 often as violent movements, but also in a much shorter time frame than 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 violence. It was like the average um, time uh, time span of a nonviolent movement was something like three years, and I think nonviolent movements were nine years. You know, and so actually violence. You, you know, but, but for either, for non, for non, for nonviolent moves, you still need to, to be committed for often years of, of hard work. And, um, and uh, yeah, so I think that's an important thing that need, people need to take away because often people do expect change to happen more quickly, I think, and they get discouraged when, you know, you have now two months of protest and if people feel like, oh, things haven't changed as much as I want, you know, and then they get let down and then they burn out and then they, you know, and then they want to disengage, you know, from the movement. Um, that's really, you know, that's, that, that's, uh, that shouldn't be happening. People need to, 
if they had a deeper appreciation for the the kind of history and trajectory of what social movements look like and how nonviolence works, then you can be, I think, more prepared, you know, for the the long the long struggle that it will take, you know. Um, so I think that's an important thing for people to appreciate. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank yes. you. Yes. God bless.